chapter 43 of the book of Genesis now and so if you have your Bibles you can turn there um, we also have a, a SoundCloud now where you can uh, if you have that app you can go to SoundCloud and listen especially if you're in England or in Sweden and we can thank uh, Daniel Crossley for that over in England he recognized the need he got a hold of me he said Mario you know we're having trouble hearing the podcast over here it cuts in and out so he uh, went forward and, and, and got us all connected with uh, SoundCloud. And uh, I'm not in Europe right now, but from what I understand, you guys can uh, listen to it, and uh, it's coming in pretty clear now. So, Daniel Crossley, thank you so much for that. <clears throat> well, um, regarding Genesis chapter 43 and 44, you know, some people say that these are possibly the two most dramatic chapters uh, in the whole Bible. Um, you can decide for yourself as we go through them. I can get a little emotional when uh, I read through these two chapters. <clears throat> and especially if you've gone through the last uh, seven or eight chapters with us and you see the beginning of Joseph's life and how things turn out and his family gets saved and what it means to us prophetically, of course, that's a big deal. And so um, we're going to go through chapter 43. Uh, but first, a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for your word, Lord. Lord, we are messed up people, and that's no secret. Anybody who's going to be honest with themselves will have to admit that just like anybody else, there is sin in our lives, and there's just no getting away from it. We're a mess. Uh, some would argue we've gotten better, and maybe that's the case. But uh, I don't know how sin can be measured. Sin is sin, and it is self-destructive, and we're born into it. And so we are extremely helpless without you. We need you. And your word tells us in the book of John, chapter 1, that uh, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. And verse 14 says that the word came and tabernacled among us. And so, Jesus, somehow, you are the word. You are the embodiment of the word of God. And so we pray that you would have your way in us and through us, that you through your word, would transform our mind. Through the Holy Spirit, you would empower us to apply your word, that we would understand your grace and how precious and how valuable, how priceless it is. And as it's displayed here in chapter 43 and 44 of Genesis, I pray that all of our listeners could see it and that I would see it, Lord, even more clearly, uh, I fail. In, in many ways, and in many ways, and many times, I, I still find myself fumbling uh, in, in darkness. And so, Lord, you know all of those dark corners of my life, and you know the dark corners of everybody's life. And so we pray, Lord, turn on the lights with these chapters, Lord. Turn on the lights. Teach us now, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, <clears throat> uh, when Joseph's brothers went to Egypt the first time, uh, it they repented uh, somewhat, um, but the process of amends, um, reconciliation that had begun uh, was still wanting. And so there's still more that God needed to do in their hearts. And um, there was still more to for them to, to surrender. They still needed to surrender more. And so just like Jesus works out the process of uh, surrender in our own lives, God is going to use Joseph to bring out a complete surrender in the hearts of his uh, brothers. And so, you know, unfortunately, uh, because some are sicker than others or some are more stubborn than others, a second trip down to Egypt is going to be necessary. And they're going to have to um, confront or Joseph is going to have to confront them uh, one more time. And so <clears throat> Genesis Chapter 43, uh, verse 1. Now the famine was severe in the land. And it came to pass, when they had eaten up the grain which they had bought 
from Egypt, or which they had brought from Egypt, that their father said to them, Go back, buy us a little food. But Judah spoke to him, saying, The man solemnly, the man being Joseph, they still don't know that that's their brother that they've been dealing with in Egypt. The man solemnly warned us, saying, You shall not see my face unless your brother is with you. If you send our brother with us, we will go down and buy food, says Judah to Jacob. But if you will not send him, we will not go down. For the man said to us, You shall not see my face unless your brother is with you. So, if you remember in chapter 42, God had revealed to Pharaoh through Joseph in a dream that this famine was going to last seven years. And so the first time they went down to Egypt, they probably brought a lot of grain, but they certainly didn't bring seven years back. Not on donkeys, they didn't. And so after some time had passed since their first visit, uh, they've run out of food. And so now uh, they're either going to starve or they're going to go back to Egypt. And they're not really desiring to go back to Egypt too much because uh, they had a difficult time last time they were there. And what's sad is they left their brother Simeon, not by choice, but Simeon is down in, in, in Egypt and he's in jail. And if they don't go back there, Simeon will never get out. But uh, selfishness has no limits sometimes. Well, up until now, if you remember Reuben, the oldest brother, he's been the spokesperson. He's been the leader of the boys. And um, now it seems that nobody's really listening to, to him anymore because uh, probably because the first trip to Egypt failed. And um, Joseph, I mean, uh, Reuben has never been one to give uh, good advice on at least a few occasions. So Judah, it appears now, is the new leader, the new spokesperson of the family. Um, and, you know, this kind of makes sense because Judah is going to agree to die in the place of Benjamin if he has to. And this makes things even more interesting because <clears throat> Jesus died in our place. And uh, it's going to turn out as we continue down uh, reading through the books of the Bible that we're going to find out that Jesus is the great, 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 great grandson of Judah. And so it's also interesting <clears throat> where Benjamin is concerned. And we haven't heard too much about him and we haven't heard anything from him. But it's interesting that nowhere are we told that Benjamin was afraid to go down to Egypt. Uh, of course. He's not going so far because, as we mentioned in the last chapter, he is Jacob's new favorite son. He and Joseph, the only two sons of his favorite wife, uh, Rachel. And as far as uh, Jacob is concerned, Joseph is dead. He doesn't know he's alive and in Egypt. And so Benjamin is all he has as far as what is uh, you know extremely precious to him. And as it turns out, um, Benjamin... Uh, is going to be, of course, the father of the tribe of Benjamin, one of the one of Israel's twelve tribes, and um, we'll find out when we get to First and Second Chronicles and First and Second Kings that the tribe of Benjamin is not afraid of anything. In fact, they are probably the most fearless warriors of all of the twelve tribes. So, you know, it's just interesting uh, what some people call spiritual DNA or gifts, talents, blessings, they're so often handed down from one generation to the next. And it's interesting, as you continue to go through the Bible with us and you read the Bible on your own and you, you know, grow in your relationship with Jesus Christ, you begin to see so many things in life through the lenses of the Bible. And I have seen this particular thing in my own life because um, in my sons, and I, I have three boys, I can see certain characteristics that resemble mine. You say, well, Mario, maybe um, that's learned behavior. Well, maybe I would agree with you, except that I have uh, my oldest son. I never knew him. I never knew of him. I never met him until he was 21 years old. And when I did meet him, he and I and my wife and my other boys and my daughter they uh, they just thought it was hilarious how so many of his characteristics resemble mine, which is evidence of the fact that it's not learned behavior. It's much more in the way of uh, spiritual DNA. If there's such a thing, maybe it should be called something else. I, I don't know. I'm not gifted for words very much, but um, that's the best way that I can describe it. But it happens. 
it happens. And apparently, it's not learned behavior. Because even when a child grows up not knowing his parents, many of the child's characteristics are that of his parents. And it's handed down even to... Uh, even when the parents become grand, have grandchildren and like that. So, Verse 6, And Israel said, Why did you deal so wrongfully with me as to tell the man whether you still had another brother? So this Israel is actually Jacob. If you've been following us through several chapters back, God changed Jacob's name to Israel. Jacob, of course, means heel catcher, manipulator, you know, sneaky guy, whatever. Israel means governed by God. But they said, the man asked us pointedly about ourselves and our family, saying, is your father still alive? Have you another brother? And we told him according to these words, could we possibly have known that he would say, bring your brother down? Then Judah said to Israel, his father, send the lad, speaking of Benjamin, Jacob's precious son, send him with me. And we will arise and go, that we may live and not die, both we and you, and also our little ones. Hey, listen, Dad. Send Benjamin with me. I will make sure that he comes back. And if not, man, how is our family? We're going to starve to death, all of us. Your sons, your grandchildren, everybody. Verse 9, I myself will be surety for him. Judah says, hey, I will be the insurance for Benjamin. From my hand you shall require him. I'll be totally responsible. If I do not bring him back to you and set him before you, then let me bear the blame forever. For if we had not lingered, surely by now we would have returned this second time. Hey, we wouldn't sitting here arguing about this whole thing. We might have been back with some food by now. So hey, Jacob, let me, or dad, let me take him. Let me take Benjamin down to Egypt. I'll handle it. I will bring him back to you all in one piece. I promise I will be insurance for that, right? So it's interesting when we see God and how he refers to Jacob as Jacob and when he refers to him as Israel. Because when God refers to him as Jacob, Jacob is in fear. He's doubting. But when, the, when God refers to him as Israel, He's acting in faith. And so here he's acting in faith, unlike the last chapter when he doubted so much. He's living in all this fear. And, you know, it would be probably easy to criticize Jacob. But the fact of the matter is each person, we all have our own process when it comes to faith in God. And sometimes our process is uh, bumpy. Uh, sometimes it's uh, we find ourselves walking or moving a little sideways. Uh, we trip, we fall. But by God's grace, we always move forward. And that's because Jesus is the one leading the way. He is the one setting up all of our circumstances. And he knows exactly how we're going to uh, react and respond. And so it's uh, for our good and for our growth. Verse 11. And their father Israel said to them, If it must be so, then do this. Take some of the best fruits of the land in your vessels and carry down a present for the man. Probably dry fruit is what they're taking down to, uh, to Egypt. Uh, a little balm and a little honey, spices and myrrh, pistachio nuts and almonds. So these are probably things that they didn't have in Egypt. And if you remember, a lot of these things are what, are what the traders had when they were traveling to Egypt and Joseph's brothers met them and sold Joseph to them. These are some of the things that they were taking down to Egypt to trade. So there was a lot of this going on anyway. Uh, he goes on to say, Take double money in your hand, and take back in your hand the money that was returned in the mouth of your sacks. If you remember, last time they were coming home from Egypt, they got hungry on the way they stopped. They got some of the grain out of the sacks to eat, and they discovered that their money was there. And, of course, it looked like they had ripped Egypt off, uh, taking the grain and taking the money that they were supposed to use to pay for it. So Jacob says, listen, when you go back, take all of these things and take the money too. straighten it out. Tell them it was all a mistake. And um, the, what, they, what they're referring to here is money is actually uh, 20 pieces of silver. I'll explain that in a second. 
And he says, uh, tell them that perhaps it was an oversight, it was a mistake. And then he goes on to say, take your brother also, that is take Benjamin, and arise, go back to the man, and may God Almighty give you mercy before the man, that he may release your other brother, that is Simeon, who's in jail, and Benjamin. If I am bereaved, then I am bereaved. He says, if this is a mistake and I grieve for the rest of my life, so let it be. I have no choice in the matter. <laughs> We're going to die of starvation if we don't make this move. And so, of course, Jacob is desperate here. And, uh, you know, him and his family could possibly, very possibly starve to death. I would imagine there's a lot of people starving at this time with this worldwide uh, famine. And so... Jacob's only option here really is to trust God. And uh, they say that uh, man's limit is God's opportunity. And so here Jacob decides to trust God with his most valuable possession. Benjamin, uh, his other sons, his grandchildren, and his wives. Everything is at stake here. And the outcome, though, is going to be the highlight of Jacob's life. He's going to find out that God is worthy of our trust. Which, you know, causes me to consider um, it's so true that God is worthy of our trust. When we reflect back on our lives and we see, when we look at our lives honestly, we, we can see that there were so many unexplainable events in our lives where we should have died, we should have got sick. Tragedy should have happened, but we were saved from that. And there's no other explanation except that God intervened. And so, you know, it's interesting because the other thing is that it, when we reflect on our lives, do an inventory or whatever, we, we find that we've made so many bad decisions. Um, we, we've gone into so many bad directions in life, but somehow we remain more confident in ourselves than the Lord. And it's just funny how that works common sense which apparently is not so common should tell me and tell us hey man trust god don't trust in your own ideas don't act so quickly take everything to prayer and let the lord decide what is the best thing for you but unfortunately uh that's not the first place that we turn so uh these stories in the bible are there to remind us now in Genesis chapter 37, verse 28, if you remember, the brothers sold Joseph for 20 pieces of silver. Now here in verse 12, they plan to pay it back. The word uh, money here in the original Hebrew is kesef, and it can refer to money or silver. And so they want to pay it back, and anybody would say, that's right. What comes around goes around. You know, the, the, the I Ching and all of these, uh, you know, religious, false spiritual perceptions. You know, some people say uh, that the, some people, you know, Buddhist uh, people who study uh, Confucius, the New Age people, they use that term a lot. Hey, what comes around goes around, you know. And apart from Jesus Christ, they're probably right. But the work of Jesus puts an end to all these ideas of repayment and punishment and judgment. And we're going to see here in a little while that when they get back and they try to pay the money, the money's not going to be accepted. They're going to be uh, informed. Hey, no, it didn't. We, we didn't think that you ripped this off. It wasn't a mistake. That money was put back in your bags because your brother Joseph, he didn't want to charge you for the food. He gave it to you. We go into detail about that in our last chapter. You could read it there or go, go through the podcast with us on that one. But, you know, this should cause anybody to ask the question, why would anybody choose Buddhism or New Age or some other religion over Jesus Christ? Why put yourself through that kind of struggle, through those kinds of philosophies? I'm going to work to get better. I'm going to attend more retreats, more workshops. I'm going to do more, you know, step studies and writing and more meetings. All of that is great. But if you want to get better, if you want to see better at its best, you're never going to be more successful than you are when you're hanging around with Jesus. Because you're going to become more like him. That's the easy way. The problem is our flesh, our ego, our pride says, no way, man, no way. I'm going to work for it. 
there's just something about us that wants to be God. And that's been since the beginning, since Genesis chapter 3, when man first fell into uh, to sin. Well, Jacob's words were, may God give you mercy before the man. Those were his parting words to his son. And those are interesting words, and they're wise words, because in Proverbs chapter 21, verse 1, it says that the king's heart is like a stream of water directed by the Lord. He guides it wherever he pleases. So like the rivers of water, God is the one who directs the heart, the choices, the decisions of kings, rulers, judges, all the people that are in power who can at some point make decisions regarding your life. And you know, it doesn't even matter if they know God personally or not. It is God that will use them like pawns to make calls in your life. And I'll tell you, I don't want to go into detail. You know my testimony if you've been going through the podcast, but I've seen it many times in my own life where I had to go before a judge and I could have been finished, washed up, man. And God had mercy. And God directed the heart of the judges and prosecutors to turn me away, to let me go. Not always without uh, punishment, but certainly not life in prison. No 50-year or 75-year prison sentences. And so, judging by uh, Jacob's choice of words, it seems that uh, Jacob has come to a place uh, of faith where he is accepting his situation as it is and putting all of his trust or all of his faith uh, in God. Verse 15. So the men took that present and Benjamin and they took double money in their hand and arose and went down to Egypt and they stood before Joseph. When Joseph saw Benjamin with him, he said to the steward of his house, take these men to my home and slaughter an animal and make ready for these men will dine with me at noon, lunch, not dinner. Then the man, that is, of course, Joseph, the steward of Joseph. Then the man did as Joseph ordered, and the man brought the men into Joseph's house. Now the men, these are Joseph's brothers, were afraid because they were brought into Joseph's house. And they said, it is because of the money which was returned in our sacks the first time that we are brought in so that he may make a case against us and seize us to take us as slaves with our donkeys. When they drew near to the steward of Joseph's house, they talked with him at the door of the house and said, Oh, sir, we indeed came down the first time to buy food, but it happened when we came to the encampment that we opened our sacks and there each man's money was in the mouth of his sack our money in full weight. So we have brought it back in our hand and we have brought it down with other money in our hands to buy more food. We do not know who put our money in our sacks. And here we go. Here is God's mercy. Here is God's grace. But he said, the steward's response to the brothers now, peace be with you. Do not be afraid. Your God and the God of your father has given you treasure in your sacks. I had your money. Then he brought Simeon out to them. He says, hey, guys, it wasn't a mistake. I was ordered to put the money back into your sacks. You didn't have to pay for this food. And by the way, here's your brother Simeon. I mean, if you have ever seen God's grace in your life like this, it is shocking. In a moment, you realize without a doubt, not only is God in heaven, the person described in the Bible, but he has noticed me and what I deserved, he didn't give me. Instead, he gave me what I didn't deserve. He gave me mercy. And it's an amazing thing. And that's what they're, they're witnessing here. By the way, this uh, steward of Joseph's house he mentions the fact that he, he says, your God and the God of your father has given you treasure in your sack. It's almost as if though this steward has come to know the God of the Bible. And if so, it's no doubt by the testimony and the lifestyle of, uh, of Joseph. And so a lot of amazing things happening here. Verse 24, 
So the man brought the men into Joseph's house and gave them water and washed their feet, or they washed their their own feet. And he gave their donkey's feet. Then they made the present ready for Joseph coming at noon, for they heard that they would eat bread there. So they're bringing out all the fruit, all of the nuts, all of the spices, all of the things that they brought as gifts to Joseph. And when Joseph came home, they brought him the present which was in their hand into the house and bowed down before him to the earth. So they bowed their faces down to the ground when Joseph shows up into the dining room there. And then he asked them about their well-being and said, Is your father well? The old man of whom you spoke, is he still alive? So Joseph walks in. These guys bow prostrate faces to the ground. And Joseph says, hey, how are you doing? And what about your father, who's really his father? Is he still alive? (laughs) And they answered, your servant, our father, is in good health. He is still alive. And they bowed their heads down and prostrated themselves. At this point, the emotions inside of the gut of Joseph are stirring and they're beginning to come up. Then he lifted his eyes and saw his brother Benjamin. So he now he finds out that his dad is well. He's back at home. And now he sees his little brother Benjamin, his mother's son, it says. So again, the only two sons of uh, Rachel. Um, and said, is this your younger brother of whom you spoke to me? And he said, God be gracious to you, my son. Now his heart yearned for his brother. So Joseph made haste and sought somewhere to weep. And he went into his chamber and wept there. The emotions are flowing uncontrollably for Joseph. Because he's at that moment in his life where the full work of God in his life is being displayed. And who can handle that emotionally? You know, so many people fake emotions today. They want to communicate something that is heavy, you know, that they want to move people. And so they'll fake a cry. And some of them are are so skilled at it, they can even pump a little tear out of the corner of their eye. And it's so popular. It's so common. I I see it so often. And, 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 you know, it, it just, it's just obvious that it's not real. Especially when you hear a person share their story over and over again. And it's right at that point. A hundred times they've they've been speaking and sharing. And it's right at that point that the cry begins. And after a while, it's like, come on, man. You know, we we, we could see what's actually going on here. That's not what's happening with Joseph. These emotions are legit, man. They They are for real. He hears that his father's okay. He sees his brother Benjamin. Simeon is out of jail. His brothers are before them fully repentant. What God has been doing for all of these years has finally come to fruition. And there's no way to explain it except that it is God and the goodness of God. It says, Then he washed his face and came out and he restrained himself and said, Serve the bread. I could see this picture so clearly in my mind. So they set him a place by himself and them by themselves and the Egyptians who ate with him by themselves because the Egyptians could not eat food with the Hebrews for that is an abomination to the Egyptians. So there was some racial uh, prejudice going on there. And they sat before him, the firstborn according to his birthright and the youngest according to his youth. And the men looked in astonishment at one another. So remember, they don't know this is their brother Joseph. And the steward of the house, they didn't know. He didn't know them personally. And yet the seating is assigned in such a way where it is the oldest all the way to the youngest in their order. And they were blown away. They said, who could know this? And at this point, they probably thought that Joseph was into some kind of Egyptian magic or something like that. But of course, that wasn't the case at all. Joseph knew the order of their birth. He was their brother. Then he took servings to them from before him. But Benjamin's serving was five times as much as any of theirs. So they drank and were merry with him. So there is this celebration going on here. Joseph had not seen his little brother in 20 years. 
He didn't know if he was dead or if he was alive. He didn't know if his father was dead or alive. And Joseph is just overwhelmed with so much emotion. Now, with the brothers um, somewhat uh, repented here, and the sight of, of Benjamin, Joseph is feeling hope of total reconciliation. He didn't know if this was going to work. He didn't know if his brothers had killed Benjamin, if his brothers had mistreated their father. His brothers were cold-blooded. Just a few chapters ago, when their sister Dina got raped, the brothers, at least three or four of them, they went into the village where it took place, and they killed all the men in the village. That wasn't just poetry. That wasn't just a story. They actually did that. And then when they were so envious of Joseph, they decided they were going to kill him until Reuben spoke and said, man, don't kill him. If you got to get rid of him, sell him to these, uh, to these slave traders here. But don't kill our brother. His brothers, Joseph's brothers, are vicious. But now he sees that there's hope for total forgiveness, repentance, and reconciliation. And so there's just joy in Joseph's heart which is the same joy in heaven when one repents of their sins and asks Jesus Christ to come into their life, to take their will in their life, to just take over completely, to forgive their sins. They admit that they're sinners. And then they ask that the power of the Holy Spirit come into them and reside in them and be their God. Just take over completely. And so there's a picture of that here with Joseph. And so, you know, when the brothers found out that they were invited into Joseph's house for lunch, they, they thought it was a setup. And um, we mentioned in the last chapter how guilt breeds fear and then fear breeds uh, paranoia. And uh, when people come to Jesus, a lot of times um, they come to Jesus, actually come to the truth of the Bible. And oftentimes they're fearful, not understanding that the grace of God through Jesus Christ, you know, is available to them. And, you know, not understanding uh, the power of the work of Jesus Christ on the cross. All their sins are paid for. And, of course, the power and the work that causes God to forgive and wash away all of their sins so that their sins are remembered no more. They don't realize this. So many new people, they don't realize that that is what we get when we offer our lives to Jesus Christ and we ask Jesus Christ to come into our own life. And so that's the idea and that's the implication here in verse 23 when uh, Joseph's servant told Joseph's brother, uh, Peace be to you. Fear not, for God and the God of your father has given you treasure uh, in your sacks. And he goes on, of course, to say that he gave him the money and he brought Simeon out of the jail and so, you know, just the love, the mercy, the grace and forgiveness of Jesus Christ is a picture of it here. And the idea is that it is available to anybody, it doesn't matter what you've done, anybody who's willing to repent, anybody who is wanting reconciliation with God, anybody who understands that prior to coming to this place, this relationship with Jesus Christ, the Bible says you were God's enemy. But just ask Jesus Christ in and it doesn't matter anymore. Your forgiveness is complete and your freedom is there for you to enjoy. It's an amazing thing. And of course, this is just the beauty of God's grace, man. It's so overwhelming. And um, the joy, the gratitude, the freedom that we experience when we make that move, it's, it's just amazing. And so Jacob, of course... Father Jacob was a heel catcher, manipulator, self-will, self-serving, all of those things. Uh, Jacob's sons were uh, vicious. They were murderers. Um, they were hateful. They were envious. They were callous to the point that they would be willing to kill their own brother. And of course, instead, they sell him off to slavery. But you know what? None of those things were enough to turn God against them. God's love, I can tell you, from my Bible knowledge, from my own experience, from the experience of so many people who are in relationship with Jesus Christ, God's love is so relentless. God's process is so sure for us individually. And from this point forward, Joseph's family is never going to be the same, as are the people 
who invite Jesus Christ into their life. You may not know it right away, but over time, walking with the Lord, it's going to be undeniable. And so the work that God had begun in each one of uh, Joseph's brothers and in Joseph and in Jacob and in Benjamin and all of the, even the life of the steward, God is going to be sure to complete the work. No different than he is going to complete the work in, uh, in your life and uh, in my life as well. Because that is just who he is. Praise God for that. Uh, well, we're going to be getting into chapter 44 now. And uh, after that, we'll only have six chapters, five chapters left to go. And then we're going to have gotten through the entire book of uh, Genesis. So praise the Lord for that. Heavenly Father, we pray that you would have your way in each of us. We love you, Lord. We want you to increase that love that we have for you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Jesus, thank you, Lord.